Explosive, devastating, terrifying, or inspiring. Yes, we're talking about volcanoes. But maybe humankind is not the only species mesmerized by these powerful forces of nature. Take Popocatpetl, an active stratovolcano that lies in the eastern half of the Trans-Mexican Volcanic Belt, 43 miles southeast of Mexico City. Nicknamed El Popo by locals, Popocatpetl most recently erupted at sunrise on January 9, 2020. But it's not only El Popo's spectacular eruptions that draw round-the-clock attention. Like many volcanoes, El Popo is a favorite haunt for UFO hunters, with numerous mysterious sightings recorded over the years. Could these sightings be absolute proof of what extraterrestrial enthusiasts have long claimed? That there's an intergalactic base below El Popo? Or are they nothing more than a rare atmospheric phenomenon? And what do extraterrestrials want with our volcanoes anyway? Some UFO hunters believe they are studying the Earth's geothermal activity or collecting samples for analysis. Jaime Mausson and others have pondered whether aliens interact with volcanoes because of the astronomical amounts of electromagnetic energy they produce. And what better starting point to understand our planet? Scientists believe that volcanoes formed the Earth's first atmosphere and continue to contribute to the carbon cycle as well as sculpt our landscape in real time. Just imagine the incredible pressure generated when massive tectonic plates are pushed together or torn apart. Not to mention the mind-blowing degree of electromagnetic energy fighting to find a release from the planet's core. Combined, these forces are of such magnitude that they cause molten rock to rise from the bubbling magma chamber beneath the volcano and move along its main vent towards the surface, where it escapes with a sudden and undeniable intensity spewing red-hot lava and clouds of thick ash high into the air. Arguably the greatest show on Earth. most amazing related to the activity of a UFO around the volcano. Is that we have amounting evidence from scores of witnesses who had national security clearances about these craft. In the year 2020, the world has been overwhelmed by the reality of a global pandemic. During this time, people will look to their community, their family, and the media for answers on what is happening to our world. On April 27, 2020, there was an official release to news media agencies from the United States Pentagon. The United States National Defense Department officially released proof of multiple declassified UFO videos captured from their state-of-the-art military aircraft. These UFO videos may prove that we are not alone in the universe. These UFO videos may be picked apart by skeptical arguments. We can sort of change the, the, the contrast range on our camera such that we can... My God, look, look at those, those strange flying entities in the sky. Oh my God, look at that. Look at those strange unidentified aerial phenomena. But to date, the world's largest military organization has released the best mainstream evidence that intelligently controlled flying aircraft that are not a part of the United States military have been seen on our planet. Sightings have been reported in mainstream news media throughout the past century, since the post-World War II UFO wave of the 1940s. Now, Stephen Bassett is a political activist and lobbyist for ufology. For over 20 years, he has been an outspoken advocate for acknowledgement and official government disclosure of information regarding the supposed ET presence. Intervention. 
An intervention is a very, very well-known term because in the modern era, people are very stressed out and uh, they need uh, oftentimes the assistance of, of um, uh, mind-altering substances uh, or mood-altering activity. And, and then we become, become addicted to it and it starts to degrade their lives. And then at some point, if it gets really bad enough, somebody, a nice friend or family, intervene and try to save them. Okay. okay. Well, human beings are addicted to war and we're addicted to consumption. Uh, which is the form of greed. Uh, and that addiction is threatening the entire civilization. Didn't used to, but it is. It's like the drunk, you know, in the early days. It's not too bad. The marriage is all right. Job's working okay. Then that starts to get a little rough pretty soon. The job's gone. The wife leaves. Okay, you got no money. And you need intervention. Well, we didn't need intervention when we made the longbow. We didn't need it when we came up with the gunpowder. We didn't need it when we came up with airplanes. But when we cracked the atom, it, we, were, we, were, we were definitely in the high throes of, of violent war addiction. And then when we built something like 70 to 80,000 nuclear weapons and had them actually, actually either in, uh, in, in launch mode or stockpiled as of about 1985, I guess you could say, we were like the drunk, you know, you know, stretched out on the couch in the living room with like 500 bottles of wine, empty bottles of wine around them. And that wasn't all. I mean, we, we as, I, and I, as I talk about in my lectures, we, we were now involved in a phenomena which I don't think is uh, uncommon in the galaxy. I think it's happened very often, and that is that we have a linear growth of our, uh, what I'll call our, just our actual physical brain, uh, our basic mental capacity to hold and, with, with, uh, hold and utilize information. And I guess you could all say our wisdom, consciousness level, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of a linear thing. It's moving along, you know. But then starting at just after the turn of the 20th century and then accelerating rapidly in 1945 and forward, above that is a exponential technology curve. And the effect of these two things is that in a short half century, a massive gap is developed between the technological advancements and humans. How did you get into the field of uh, UFOs and politics? Uh, the short answer is I uh, en entered the extraterrestrial phenomena issue in 96. Uh, and it was a decision I made in late 95. And it was just a ca case of I need to, uh, I'm just not interested in doing what I'm doing. Uh, it's not particularly useful to me or anybody else. So what would really interest me? And this had always been there for me. I like to say it was like I was driving, you know, randomly through my life in a motorcycle, and I had a sidecar attached, and the ET issue was in that sidecar all along, and I wasn't paying attention. And so I did several. I read a couple of key books, particularly John Mack's book, Abduction, and um, went to a conference or two, and I, I was very impressed with where things were, and I'm going, this is really happening, a mature thing. I knew what the implications would be if it were to finally break out as a formal thing, and I said, I'll do this. Uh, it was that simple. I was lucky in, in the choice I made in terms of where to start. Uh, because I'd read Max's book, I knew about his organization in Cambridge, Program for Extraordinary Experience Research. So I contacted them, and I talked with the director, Karen Wesolowski. And she was gracious enough to allow me to come and volunteer. John E. Mack was a Pulitzer Prize winning author and Harvard psychiatrist who engaged in a decade plus study of alien abduction starting in the early 1990s. John Mack studied around 200 men and women who claimed to have been abducted, and he remains one of the most esteemed academic figures to have studied the phenomenon. John Mack never definitively said that he thought aliens are definitely taking people, but he did say, quote, that there is a compelling, powerful phenomenon here that I can't account for in any other way that is mysterious and it seems to me that it invites a deeper further inquiry end quote mac had a particular interest in the spiritual and transformational aspects of alien encounters 
and the idea that abduction could expand our notion of reality. The last book he wrote was titled Passport to the Cosmos, where he talked to and studied various abductees who claimed to have had a positive and even transcendent abduction experience. Now, being a Harvard psychiatrist who believed that there was something to alien abduction was no easy task. In May of 1994, the dean of Harvard Medical School appointed an investigation into Mac, and the committee chairman, Arnold Relman, suggested that, quote, to communicate in any way whatsoever to a person who has reported a close encounter with an extraterrestrial life form is professionally irresponsible, end quote. But once word got out that the investigation was taking place, other people in the academic community started questioning the ethics of such an investigation, and it was eventually dropped. And the dean reaffirmed that Mac had the freedom to study whatever he wishes and to state his opinions without impediment. But over 20 years later, that attitude has not changed among scientific academia, and the topic is still very much considered taboo and unworthy of any real study. Most ufologists would say the number one reason for that resistance is fear of the unknown. I went out there and I volunteered for about four months, and I was kind of there just after uh, Mac was assaulted uh, by Phil Class, who tried to bring him down. That's a long story, don't go into it here, but I was kind of there for that. That was interesting. That kind of boiled my activist blood a little bit. Well, what was was recovered was a radar target, no, it balloon wasn't. board. That, that, is, that is the cover story that was put out. We know it was a cover story based on the testimony of the people who put out the cover story. General Thomas DuBose was the chief of staff of the 8th Air Force at uh, Fort Worth Army Airfield, General Ramey's chief of staff. General DuBose told us that the balloon story that Phil insists upon talking about was a cover story put out by the government simply to get the reporters yeah, off the back. back. Philip, are you a debunker? of all UFO stories, well, is that I, your purpose? I, I look for explanations. Although Philip Klass regularly dismissed claims of ET visitation, he has been quoted saying that 98% of people who report seeing UFOs are intelligent, honest people who have seen something. So I then went and got involved in uh, the politics right after that and stayed away from the contact aspect for years. I just didn't say anything about it. And the reason was just trying to get the press, particularly the political media, which is where I really focused, let alone anybody in Congress, to address just the fact that ETs are here, which is a big deal, right? And the, cover, the truth and bar was cover-up then. I, I, I worked, I think, probably responsible for the switch to truth embargo, which you now hear, because it's, the cover-up is not correct. Truth embargo is correct. But, you know, but you've got your, you got to take the whole time frame in, in, in the, uh, consideration here. Uh, remember, this is 70. We're in the 70, roughly. It's the 70 uh, first year since Roswell. The truth embargo really wasn't coming together until the early 50s. But between 47 and 52, when the ETs turned up over the Capitol, which definitely got their attention, right? <laughs> you know, they were kind of going, ah, we can finesse this. It's all right. The Oswell has been buried. It's all good. And we'll work it out. And then the ETs turned over the capital. Oh, God. They're going, Christ. So they really had to get serious. And after that, they got serious. The official U.S. Air Force word on UFOs is that they are not a threat to our national security. And that has been the official word for over 60 years. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. Since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports. The great book of them. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, or as light aberration. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage, and that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. It was while I was in Cambridge that I, I realized what I wanted to do and what was the right for me was to engage the politics of this, which was not happening. There was just almost nothing formal about it at all. There have been things behind the scenes, definitely. Uh, Claiborne Pell and a few others that had tried to approach it, but I, wasn't, I didn't even know about that. 
but not the formal engagement. And so I had this idea, wow, go to Washington, stay in one of the homes there. I had family there and stay there and, uh, and, and register as a lobbyist. No one had ever done it. And, and then I, I created the first, set up the first political action committee on the on ET issue, and then I put the first exopolitics conference up. And what was great about this is that it, I'd, I'd found a niche where nobody was doing it. Uh, it's nice to be first, right? And that was great. And, and uh, from that, being a registered lobbyist, first one, uh, got attention of the media in Washington, I started getting interviews, and that launched my political engagement. Uh, I created Paradigm Research Group as the name for the uh, lobbying uh, work I was doing, pro bono, uh, on behalf of supposedly uh, research groups, right, organizations. That's why I called it Paradigm Research Group. But it's not a research organization. It's a political advocacy organization. But I kept the name. And um, uh, that was how it began, 96 to about 97 about the, the, the developing politics of UFOs, which is what we called it for a while. Uh, then it became the politics of disclosure. Perhaps there is some important link between UFOs and volcanic activity. In Latin America, one of the most famous and outspoken journalists on the UFO phenomenon is Jaime Maussan. He has researched many different aspects of the phenomenon that have been recorded across Latin America. Volcanoes are one of the most destructive forces of nature known to man. Because of the ever-present dangers of volcanoes across Latin America, many news agencies, including Jaime Maussan's and government organizations, have been monitoring volcanic activity for over 100 years. Cameras of various kinds and other scientific instruments have captured UFO activity around many active volcano sites across Latin America. In 1988, an incredible event was caught on a news crew's cameras in broad daylight. One of the clearest and most impactful recordings was captured at Colima's fiery volcano during an eruption. When this fire giant erupted, pyroclastic flows. In this video, one can clearly see an object entering this lethal cloud made from ash, magma stones, and gases at a high temperature, something that is practically impossible for any man-made vehicle. When this happened, a videographer, Francisco Guzman, recorded the object entering the cloud. This object passed through the tolvanera, very close. Vemos cómo atraviesa el volcán por la parte eh, delantera del volcán y cómo se nos pierde eh, en el horizonte, ¿sí? Para mí es, vaya, es uno de los, es uno de los avistamientos para mí más importantes porque hemos, hemos tenido yo y mis compañeros de trabajo, pues experiencias también de otros, otros igual de, de emocionantes y, y de interesantes. Eh, hay una cosa muy curiosa. El volcán ha estado a última fecha activo. En tiempos que el volcán está muy pasivo, no tenemos reportes. Es lo interesante. Eh, por coincidencia, las veces que ha estado activo el volcán, hemos tenido avistamientos. July 7, 1991. On this date, a UFO was witnessed by local police. And this became a major event in Mexico's UFO history. During the night, Police officers decided to make their rounds near the city of Atlixco in the state of Puebla, which is close to the volcano Popocatapetl. Everything was going by standard routine till they saw a strange object in the sky. The officers were curious, and they were certain that this was a drug trafficker's airplane. The photographer that was with them took out his camera, and he was able to capture a picture of the craft. When they developed the film, they couldn't believe what they saw. The object was completely unrecognizable. It wasn't a plane or a helicopter. The object resembled a metallic craft with five orange lights surrounding its circular shape. Two years after this sighting, the volcanic activity would begin at Popocatapetl. There are no nearby airports or places where these objects could be coming from or mistakenly landing, which is why it became another piece of evidence that could not be explained.
December 20th to 21st of 1994. At this time in Mexico's history, citizens and the media were becoming more widely aware of the UFO presence across the country. It was also becoming very obvious that there was a relationship between the presence of so-called UFOs and the volcanic activity happening throughout Mexico. In 1996, Norway's Bergen University confirmed that inside the volcano Popocatapetl, actual electromagnetic storms occurred. At the time, certain phenomena was being registered that, unfortunately, were not presented by Bergen University in a program it recorded for Discovery Channel. This phenomenon, Jaime Maussan states, would prove that UFOs seemed to siphon electromagnetic energy away from the volcanoes, which seemed to reduce activity. But Jaime's team claimed that Bergen University refused to ever publish their studies with the Discovery Channel, believing the reason was that they were afraid to do so. At dawn of December 20th, 1994, Alfonso Reyes, a Mexican photojournalist who worked with a number of newspapers, went to the volcanic area with his camera. He took a sequence of photographs, each with an exposure time of 20 seconds. In one of these photos, which you see right now, you can see how an object approached the crater before turning upwards. It is without a doubt an extraordinary image. An unknown object that approaches the crater at the moment the volcano is erupting. It is truly extraordinary to capture this moment. Notamex consulted with experts before releasing the photograph to its subscribers. The image seemed to be real. It was published by Tercer Millennio. And now, Alfonso Reyes tells his story behind capturing this unique image for the newspaper called Notamex. La fotografía se tomó en el paraje que se conoce como Tlamacas, un poco antes de llegar al refugio alpino que está justamente al pie del volcán. Llegamos por el lado de Santiago Salicintla, subimos por el Paso de Cortés y llegamos a este sitio alrededor de las tres y media de la mañana, después de la segunda explosión. Colocamos en el suelo la cámara, las primeras fotografías, como te repito, fueron de la explosión, las trabajamos con 800 milímetros. Cuando ya hicimos las fotografías de la explosión, yo cambié el lente de, de, de 400 milímetros con teleconvertidor y coloqué un lente de 24 milímetros para hacer la fotografía del aspecto. Esto fue cuando, cuando decidí hacer la fotografía, cambiar el diafragma, colocar un F4 y dar una exposición de 20 segundos. Esta secuencia específica del, del, de, la toma, del, de, la toma, de la toma panorámica fueron siete fotogramas. La fotografía donde aparece el efecto este es en el segundo fotograma. Entonces, cuando salió el negativo, me lo entregaron en una tira. Muy bien cuidado, por cierto, déjame decirte, pero al momento de revisarlo, ese negativo tenía esa, esa línea que se notaba claramente en una fila de seis más uno que apareció por ahí en la parte de abajo, se notaba claramente como tenía esa línea. Entonces, revisé el negativo y me fijé que era. Y antes de protestar, porque me habían maltratado un negativo, ¿sí? me fijé que era una cosa que no estaba, no estaba adherido, no era una raya y no, no, estaba, este, eh, no estaba partido el negativo. Mis compañeros estaban... Este, puestos ahí, revisándola todos. Todos los estábamos ahí, la vimos. La gente que revisó la fotografía ahí en, el, en, la, en la tienda de foto, me dijeron, señor, no está rayada, es, es algo que se apareció en, la, en el negativo. No vamos a pensar que era una fotografía extraordinaria porque aparece muy nítido. Esta franja que aparece aquí, sí, en la impresión, aparece muy, muy, muy nítida. Eh, nosotros estábamos trabajando ahí con tres cámaras. Eh, En un momento, bueno, yo estaba trabajando con, con un lente 400, igual exposiciones este, prolongadas. Eh, había un intercambio de, de, de equipo este, para captar es, es, esos momentos, ese amanecer. Y bueno, pues este, mi compañero fue el que captó esa imagen. Y es un trabajo realmente profesional. Como debe de ser uno como fotógrafo, debe de apreciar lo que es la naturaleza, debe de captar la realidad y bueno, pues... Lo que se buscó en esa noche fue captar la realidad de ese fenómeno tan hermoso, eh, toda esa naturaleza que nos empapaba. Y posteriormente, bueno, <coughs> realmente este, fue secundario lo que captamos, ¿no? Creo que algo, algo inédito, algo que no esperábamos. Y bueno, pues eh, en base a, a, al trabajo profesional de mi compañero Alfonso Reyes, eh, yo te puedo asegurar que es un trabajo profesional limpio, eh, que, que la realidad lo capta y, este, y bueno, pues es un hecho que se comparte, ¿no? Yo conozco a este Alfonso desde hace muchísimo tiempo. Somos compañeros inclusive de universidad. Y no, no pienso que él haya hecho un, un truco de estos, ¿no? O sea, definitivamente es una fotografía verídica. Ah, ahora sí. 
Builder. Mira. Wow. Holy shit. Holy. Wow. Oh. In 1992, a reporter from 60 Minutes that was a diver too, went up to the volcano Popocatépetl to the crater at almost 5,000 meters in altitude to do diving in a little lake that was in the crater in 92. He went there and then he found that was so hot and there was sulfur. Then I realized that the volcano was becoming active. And I realized there was a relation between the sightings of UFOs and the activity of the volcano. This activity of the volcano grew as well as the, as the sightings of UFOs. Then I predicted back in 1994, because of so many sightings, that I thought that the volcano was going to erupt. People saying, ah, oh, Jaime, you have created a huge problem because now the properties around the volcano have lost their value because of you reporting 60 minutes. And I said, but it's gonna happen. No, oh, you are crazy, man. Two months later, we have a huge eruption in the volcano Popocatépetl. Then I realized that this relation was absolutely real. In August 1996, the Bergen University from Norway came working for Discovery Channel. And they detect huge storms of electromagnetic storms under the volcano. And I mean huge. Then one night they saw a light above the volcano flashing in the top and suddenly all the energy, and you can see this in the machines, whap, drop, almost to nothing. Was somebody taking that energy from there? They couldn't explain it. They said it was the most amazing thing they have ever seen in their lives. They were going to present this in Discovery, and nothing happened. But I realized then, as they told me, that this was the most magnetic place in the world because the chamber on the, of the, this volcano is huge. It's under Mexico City. From then on, I realized that this was this relation. In 1999, the volcano almost erupted or begin of the eruption. And then you can see a sphere coming down and thorning up at this last moment. If you see that, it's very clear that there was activity in the middle of that eruption of the volcano, UFO activity. And then two months later, for the first time, thanks to the camera of the scientist, the Centro Nacional de Prevención de Desastres, Senapred, we saw a, a large object going inside the crater of the volcano for the first time, but not for the last. We have seen many, 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 many times going in and out UFOs from this crater. At the beginning, I thought it was fantasy. It was crazy because even before, at the beginning of the activation of this volcano, people said, oh, there are UFOs going inside the crater. And I said, that's crazy. <clears throat> It's impossible. How can they go inside an active volcano in the crater? And the crater is almost, there is no hole there. A little hole, but it's almost completely closed. Well, now I can tell you, I have the images. Well, you can see these objects going in and out continuously. Then I know that there is a relation when the volcanoes are active. In 2003, <clears throat> with the Arenal Volcano in Costa Rica, we got this video. 
the most amazing video of a UFO around the volcano. And the video is real, where you can see this uh, UFO going around the volcano and doing many, many things in, in front of one camera and the people commenting on that. This video is authentic. Nobody has proven that it's not. And it's the most amazing related to the activity of a UFO around the volcano. It is forbidden that the airplanes get close to the uh, volcano. Since 1994, the airplanes have to go around the volcano, especially when it's active because of the ash. Then we know that there are no airplanes close to the volcano. But also, if you look to the videos, you will realize that they are, they are not airplanes. It's very clear. The airplanes don't go inside a crater. The airplanes don't go inside the volcano on the sides. Then uh, anybody who investigates this is going to realize that there is something else going on around the volcano. I'm not saying extraterrestrial, but I don't know anything else that could do what I've seen these objects to do. Back in December of the year 2000, Alfonso Reyes from a newspaper from an agency, as a matter of fact, took this photograph where you can see an object getting close to the volcano and turning right at the last moment. The volcano was almost erupting. After that happened, after that picture, the energy reduced like nothing. In Mexico, the government had announced that the volcano was going to erupt there was evacuation around the area. But after this picture, nothing happened. And then I think, and then I thought that probably these UFOs are controlling the volcano or probably they take the energy from the volcano and then the activity reduces in just a few minutes. It's something that I cannot explain but the evidences prove that it's something extraordinary. The El Centro Nacional de Prevención de Desastres, CENAPRED, had cameras around the volcano. Back in the February 14th, 2001, these cameras took a long object for the first time going inside the crater of the volcano. And from then on, not just the CENAPRED cameras, but also webcams de Mexico, security cameras, and our cameras, because we have cameras, uh, you know, observing the volcano 24 hours a day, we have been able to obtain incredible evidences around this volcano. I don't know if all the volcanoes in the world have this activity because there are no cameras like in this one. But this volcano is so close to so many millions of people that we have to take many measures to protect these people. And that's why we have all these cameras. All cameras, the cameras of Tercer Millennium are high definition, very modern cameras. And these cameras allow us to see the volcano very clearly every night. Over the years, the volcanic area where the Popocatapetl and the Iztacihuatl are located has been home to multiple sightings of unidentified flying objects. Tercer Millennium will now have the equipment to record and broadcast in high definition video over the internet. With this new project, they will be able to see activity as it happens, like never before. Sí, pero nunca a nivel profesional. Estamos hablando, por ejemplo, inclusive ni ni siquiera a nivel militar. Eh, desde el principio fue un reto y sigue siendo. Queremos ver qué si somos capaces y cómo. Básicamente el proyecto en sí también va acoplado a lo que es un sistema de server IP 
con el que puedes jugar y transportar la imagen a otros sitios, pero además este, hacer programaciones, por ejemplo, tipo auto-tracking. El sistema auto-tracking te permite pues, dejar el equipo instalado, en este caso lo que vamos a hacer en las faldas del volcán, para que si ocurriera algo pues, se pueda hacer un seguimiento. No necesitas tener un monitoreo 24 horas con el joystick en la mano y de forma automática se pueden generar esas tomas que esa es eh, en sí una cámara que lo vea todo y que lo vea con alta definición la que existen pero son con muchísimas limitaciones no para este caso para el caso que se que se va a trabajar aquí vamos a iniciar con un, una primera una primera instancia en 36x en calidad 4k eh, con presión h265 y con ralentizaje de nocturno para poder ver imágenes con poca luminosidad. On several occasions, UFOs have been captured entering the crater of Popocatépetl volcano. Cenepred, Televisa, and amateur video from Mexico have managed to obtain extraordinary images of these sightings. And now Tercer Millenio has that ability as well. The new technologies will give them the opportunity to record eruptive events in high definition. And at the same time, any object that appears in the area will be seen with total clarity. Through a high definition volcanic monitoring system, On October 25th, 2012, the, there was a huge UFO going inside the crater. This video was recorded by the Televisa cameras and it was presented on the news. And they said, this happened, we don't know what it is. Uh, and then they tried to get explanations from the scientists and they didn't know what to say. One astronomer said, oh, it's a galaxy falling. A galaxy falling inside the crater or what? You know, it was something so crazy. And on May 30th, 2013, we can see again a UFO now, it seems like, like a disc going around the crater and suddenly going inside the crater. <clears throat> How can you explain that? Nobody has tried. The image is real. It was recorded by different cameras. You know? And it's an irrefutable evidence. These things go inside the volcano. Is there a base in the bottom? Are they doing studies, analysis, what it is? I don't know. You know as much as I do. I don't know. But the evidence is there. Can anybody explain this? Yeah, since 2016, we have our cameras, our high-definition cameras, special cameras for environment, because you have to understand that the, uh, the, the climate there is very harsh. Huge storms, haze, snow, coal, ash, everything. They have to resist everything. And then we got a very good camera from uh, Switzerland, and we put this camera there, uh, we have been able to see things that are just unbelievable. Like this object, black object that comes on the side, it comes very fast, stops, and then goes down and goes inside the mountain. Not the crater, but it disappears on the side of the mountain. I mean, this is an irrefutable evidence because it was recorded with our camera. The image is original. Nobody has done anything to that image. Then I think it proves that these intelligences or whatever they are, are here because there is no explanation for the, this video. There is no other explanation to this video.
This was recorded in broad daylight by Terser Millennio's volcanic monitoring system on January 2017. This is one of the clearest examples of the presence of unidentified flying objects. But the most extraordinary thing is how it disappears as it approaches the cone of the volcano. The report was made by the volcano watchman, Aldo Arambula. Pay attention to what happens here. The object approaches the volcano. After stopping in the sky, it descends directly to the volcano's base, where it disappears. This is in slow motion. So where did it go? It seems to have simply disappeared. This video confirms the existence of these objects in volcanic zones. Some people believe that they could be using the natural energies of these sites to move around this planet or the universe. After we set our cameras, we presented the signal live and it's open to anybody in the world. People who started watching the volcano 24 hours a day reported any time that there was something strange in, in the volcano. And that way with my team, my people, I was able to get a very factual reports of what happened in the volcano. We had the images, but it was, it is very difficult to watch anything 24 hours a day. But when you have the help of hundreds or thousands of people, not just in Mexico, but around the world, then you can really track, follow the activity very closely. And because of that, we were able to, to get so many evidences from this camera. It is just amazing. Any investigator who wants to come from anywhere in the world and want to see these images is going to realize how important is this. And there is something very, very interesting. In the last year, the sightings reduced completely. And I don't know why. The volcano has been active and non-active continuously. But it seems like uh, at this moment, there is no interest of UFOs, or I don't know what is happening, but then scientists at this moment are very nervous and they think that this volcano could go on eruption very soon. And this is a very, very, very dangerous volcano. And I mean very, because it can release so much ash that could inundate Mexico City and other cities, big cities like Puebla, Cuernavaca, Cuautla. I'm talking about millions of people cities with ash and could be a disaster for Mexico. The year is 2012, and in this video, we see an unidentified flying object slowly approaching the volcano's crater until it seems to go inside. These images come from Mexico's National Disaster Prevention Center. The image is extraordinarily clear a large cylindrical object that approaches the volcano. Later this year, on October 25th of 2012, a large object was captured by one of Televisa's cameras, a national news agency of Mexico. The object clearly enters the volcano's crater. Scientists, astronomers, and volcanologists were unable to provide an explanation for this. This object was captured with an infrared light spectrum camera and all other cameras recording in the standard light spectrum could not perceive it. By May 30th, 2013, a disc-shaped object approaches the volcano, turns, and seems to, again, go into the crater. What is the explanation for this? These objects seem to sometimes hover, stop, and turn before going into the volcano. This couldn't be explained away as an asteroid, a missile, or some conventional aircraft landing in or around the volcano. Again, 
There are no nearby airports or places where these objects can land near the volcano. This is restricted airspace. Some months later, on June 13th, 2013, another object was recorded by an anonymous source. Another cylindrical object approaches the volcano's crater. At this moment, it was evident that something was happening inside the crater. In conventional terms, it seems completely impossible to explain. More recently, a Tercer Millennio camera was placed in this area, and they started to capture images such as this one, captured on August 12, 2016. Again, we can see an object, smaller than its predecessors, carrying out a slow maneuver as it approaches the crater before going inside when there is obviously volcanic activity going on. No helicopter nor plane or drone could survive the heat of an active volcano. Tercer Millennio's camera started capturing more and more images of objects that appeared from behind the volcano. They appeared from the sides. They ascended with very clear inclination, or in some cases, descended toward the volcano's crater directly. These objects can be seen constantly. It is impossible that these could be missiles sent from Mexico, asteroids from space, or conventional aircraft. See for yourself. Here we can see up to three objects next to the volcano. More than there are normally, ascending or descending. This is just a possibility. Have they abandoned us? Are they not interested in the volcano anymore? Is there a reason why the activity of the volcano has increased lately and the UFOs are not here? Are they coming back? I cannot answer any of these questions, but this is what is happening right now that we are talking. On March 20th, 2019, again, UFOs are present. Notice the quality of the image and how we can see one of these objects go inside the volcano. Notice the inclination and the downward movement. This is not how airplanes descend, not helicopters or drones either. August 14th, 2019, again, we get a truly extraordinary video when another one of these objects ascends in a straight line toward outer space from the proximity of the volcano. The object exits the crater, and it can clearly be seen as it exits the active volcano.
Notice this video taken on November 21st, 2019, of an object which Mexican astronomers said was clearly an asteroid. The object should have exploded. It is also a cylinder in shape. Like past objects seen going into the volcanoes around Latin America, the object should have exploded. Do you think this is an asteroid? Do you think this is an asteroid? This is just a possibility. And whether or not it is true, you will have to decide for yourself. On January 10th, 2020, we can once again see an object that some might call a meteorite. However, the object doesn't fall. It follows a horizontal descent towards the volcano, unlike what would be expected from a meteorite. Starting on January 12th, there would now be a different observable phenomenon. Later on that night, this video was captured, but we cannot see this object in the normal light spectrum. You can see the hour, the minutes, and the seconds in both images. And you can see the object in the infrared light spectrum camera. However, while we can see it on the infrared camera, in the normal spectrum camera, it is not visible. These objects can be seen with the infrared camera, but they were also recorded at the same time by a normal spectrum camera. And probably the most powerful me me messaging, messaging that has emerged from this phenomena, which I constantly push and have since 2001, and will continue. And it's probably the most clear example of how the truth embargo is effective because there is no way in hell that logically uh, every academic in the country, a relative, re relevant academic or a, a political media or national security reporter would not be all over this, and they are not, is that we have a mounting evidence from scores of witnesses who had national security clearances as working on strategic missile bases, which is, you know, a little harder job to get than, I don't know, greeter at Walmart, uh, about these craft uh, coming down over their, their facility and turning the missiles off, often. And we have evidence for that, it was written up. There would be accounts of this sort of happened and it'd be in the local paper, and then you don't hear anything. And, 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 and it, no response from the government. And so Robert Hastings, of course, is the one that really broke this wide open with his book, landmark book, UFOs and Nukes, and some of the key witnesses like Robert Sala. And now we know that it happened a lot. Now this has been put in front of the nose of the media and the Congress repeatedly, they will not touch it. That's all you need to know about a truth. What exactly about that particular account, those accounts, it doesn't say national security. What is it about that you don't think is really a news story? Embargo, period, right? Okay. Why are they doing that? Do they melt them down so that they're useless? No, they just turn them off. Can we turn them back on? Yeah, as soon as they leave. Well, the witnesses that I've talked to have all pretty much reached the same conclusion. They're not, they're not it's a fairly narrow interpretation. This is messaging. The messages, these are of no, they certainly, well, the message is one, they're not a problem for us, in case you think they are, uh, and why the hell do you have them? We're overwhelmed, right? 
we're facing so many technological threats now to our existence. Our chemicals polluting every river and the oceans, even radiating the oceans now. Yeah, a radioactive Pacific, who knew? Um, biotechnology, genetics that could be used for untold awful things or great things. Um, of course, nuclear weapons. The Air Force has even been looking into antimatter weapons. Trust me, that's, uh, that could make a big bomb. AI, robotics, all of this, it's, boom, it's, it's gone. We're still down here. It's awful. So what, all right? Intervention. Okay. So in my model of this, one of the fundamental things going on and the reasons for their presence here is intervention. And then the question is why? Well, the only explanation I can give for that is they actually care what happens to us. Why do you intervene with your Uncle John, right? Because, you know, you care for him and his family and his kids and his wife and everything else. And you just know it's all going to be destroyed because, you know, he's uh, gotten a little too deep into the uh, Oxycontin, you know what I mean? So you intervene. The intervention becomes, well, I think, rigorous, starts to become rigorous in 47 and has escalated since. They knew, uh, and, 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 and there may be a tie between our current status and the genetic work they're doing and the hybrids they're creating. It's a very interesting tie-in. It's super advanced. We're talking, you know, PhD level here. Well, I don't get into it. You know, in, in, in news reports and stuff like that. I, I, but for people that know what the hell's going on to some degree, there may be an overlap here, but at minimum, it's an intervention. Because they care, okay. Meaning somehow or another, this intervention is going to help close that gap between the exponential technology growth, uh, not only simply in, in, in quantity, but quality, right? And our current status, mentally, physically, and emotionally, as human being, can close that gap. Great, but it ain't gonna happen by just flying around and putting crop circles down. It's gonna require open contact. Now that's the real open contact, okay? It's one thing when an ET shows up in your bedroom at two in the morning. It's another thing when he shows up, or he sh she shows up on CNN having a chat with Wolf Blitzer. Maybe not in the same place, maybe on Skype, because, you know, there's some issues there in terms of that happening, but uh, that's a whole different matter. Now that's open contact. That is where I think this is going. And somehow the open contact creates possibilities for interaction between us and their civilizations. And those interactions will serve to assist us in closing that gap between where we are as humans and the technology waves that are coming at us. We have presented overwhelming evidence that volcanoes from across Latin America seem to be hotspots of UFO activity. Perhaps there is some important link between UFOs and volcanic activity, but only with time will we find out more of the truth behind their presence and their importance to one of the most destructive natural phenomena known to man.
arguably the greatest show on earth.